Well, welcome. Tonight we have a face that's been familiar to Milford for a long time. Yeah. I remember the first election night live show we did when you showed up with Willie Kincaid <laughs> to help us go through our election. So why don't we start with an introduction of our future lieutenant governor. Of course. Well, Al, I'm really happy to be here. And a shout out to Will, too, and his family, always showing me a good time around here in Milford, which is really in my backyard, given that I grew up here in Worcester County. Uh, Shrewsbury is my home area. So it's very nice to be here to just have a discussion about this upcoming election, which is very, very important. We have an open seat for governor. And for those that are listening, this election really matters because it's a decision that you have to make about the next governor for the next four years. And I think it could lead to easily eight years, depending on the performance of those that first term. So myself, my background, I'm from Shrewsbury. That's where I was born and raised. It's where my whole family is. Uh, my children are fourth generation. Uh, Shrewsbury, and I know you have longevity here in Milford. And it's great to be able to be in a hometown that was so good to me growing up. I remember the rival between Shrewsbury and Milford football. football. Thanksgiving and now, football. Now my children, uh, they're 11 and 9. They're on the football field and cheer field. And it's just great to be at that stage in life. But Shrewsbury was always good to me growing up. You know, I come from a family of public servants. My grandfather was a school committee member, longest serving town meeting member. And then I got involved in public service a after I graduated Boston College, New England School of Law, and wanted to come back to Central Mass to begin my career and give back to my community. And that's when I started uh, to think about serving. Town meeting member, ran for a seat on the Board of Selectmen. It was May 1st, 1995, when I was first elected. And then from there, it was Paul Salucci, who invited me to run for higher office. I really hadn't had that in my cards. I did. I served for 10 years in the House of Representatives. I really enjoyed that experience representing my hometown of Shrewsbury and Westboro and really giving voice in a bipartisan way with my colleagues here in central Massachusetts. I remember serving with Marie Parenti, uh, who was a very vocal and, and active voice here. And now John Fernandez is your state representative now. I also then went on after my 10 years I served. I said, that's enough. Time for someone else to come in and serve. It shouldn't be there forever. And I ran for a seat in the state treasury. I fell a little short. And then I said, OK, now I'm really done, Al. And I'll just go back to my, my private life in Shrewsbury, running my family's real estate no, and construction gonna, we business. No, we weren't going to let you do that. And then just run the business, be close to home, the kids and everything. And that's when Charlie Baker called and said, you know what, I'm going to give it a, sh a shot. And I'd love you to be my running mate so that we can team up, bring all of our experiences, you know, myself, small business, having served in local and state government. Charlie, being someone from the larger business experience, turned around Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, served under the Weldon Salucci administrations as the Health and Human Services Secretary and the Budget Secretary. And we both were selectmen starting off our public service. And I said, you know what? It's an open seat. The political climate seems right for change with the right leaders for the state. I'll give it a shot with you, Charlie. And here we are a year later having crisscrossed the state, having met so many good people along the way. 46 days before you and, take office. And just a few more days left here. With a lot of work to do still. We feel uh, you know, honored to be in this position as the nominees of our party. But it really transcends party. We just feel we're the right team. We're the right brand of leaders. We are the right people to serve the needs of our state today. And it would be an honor to earn the support of the Milford families, the people that get up and work so hard in this community every day, doing everything right, you know, saving their money for their kids' future, trying to pay their bills on time, get to work, do all the good things that they do. They need a voice. And we feel that the working families have been held back, haven't been able to get ahead. And we want to just change it up a bit in Massachusetts and get that going again. So we'll start with the basic question I've asked everybody. <laughs> I'm from Milford. Why should I vote for you? You should vote for Charlie Baker and Karen Polito because we are the right team. We are the right people with the experience both in the public and private sector to on day one roll up our sleeves and get to work. Get to work fixing our state government. Get to work growing jobs so that people can work and earn their way and be proud of their achievements. 
get to work helping our communities with the resources they need for great schools and safe neighborhoods and get to work moving Massachusetts in a new and better direction. We talk about local aid and I know you've all have taken a pretty strong yes. position. Talk to me about your stand on local aid. Well sure, uh, certainly I bring a perspective as a local official, former selectman. You lived it. Lived in the legislature with this issue and as a mother with two children in public schools. So this is a very important issue for everyone because Al, people feel their quality of life on the local level. This is where they get up every day, the pothole in their streets fixed, the sidewalks are safe for their kids, the schools that they go to every day, the police and fire are there should they need something in an emergency situation. This is where they feel it, so this is where it needs to work. Charlie Baker and I are the only candidates with a real plan. Now our plan is not something we just, you know, thought about overnight. We understand what needs to get done. What needs to get done is you're going to build that relationship up again between the state and local government. First, this is a state budget that is $36.5 billion. And over the past eight years, one party controlling everything, the state budget's grown $6 billion, but they've cut aid to our cities and towns $600 plus million. And when I get around and Charlie gets around and meets town and local officials, city officials, they all know that the cuts have really hurt. So what we're going to do, we have promised we're going to grow state revenue because our business policies, we're going to crank up this economy, we're going to grow revenue at the state level. And that percentage of growth, we're going to apply that same percentage to your local aid to grow it back. I mean, the high water mark for a lot of communities was 2008. We need to get that, that funding back up yeah. there. We also won't pass unfunded mandates. We'll, sh we'll share in that responsibility. And there are so many mandates that are on the books that probably could take a fresh look at and peel back what doesn't make any sense anymore. And then just have that seat at the table, that open you know, line on the, on the phone to make sure that our local officials feel they can call their lieutenant governor and governor any day of the week and get a response when they need something for their community. We're committed to that and we will do that. Well, you've been here. We see you around at the Portuguese picnic, at all the events. Oh, gosh, I love that Portuguese picnic. And In fact, when I came recently, it was just so great because I met so many friends and that I know, all of you, and then just going and seeing so many hardworking business people, a lot of people in construction, like my family, been in the construction business for years. And I said it's nice that they can relax and enjoy something like that in the community but also I know how hard they work, so it, it goes hand in hand. You've got a great community here in Milford. How do you change the government? Because, you know, you sit there and say, okay, we're going to cut your local aid. Oh, we're but, not. But No, but I'm we're just saying for years it. we've been living with, we're going to cut your local aid, but we're going to increase our spending. Oh. How do you get your hands around that animal okay. and turn it? Well, first of all, we know we got to grow the state revenue again, so we need to send the signal to the small businesses that make up the backbone of our economy here in Massachusetts and say, listen, we're not going to raise taxes. In fact, we're going to try to bring down the cost of doing business. That's health care. That's energy costs. That's regulation that really does a number on a lot of small businesses you know, that uh, try to permit a site for a new operation or whatever it is. We can look at the regulatory structures and reduce that burden on our small businesses. So we want to grow that revenue again at the state level. And when we grow the revenue, it, it becomes uh, an issue of accountability. And Charlie and I both have been in business. We know how to manage budgets, and we know how to build teams and get results. So our state government right now just needs managers. They need someone that's going to take a look at every agency, do, do the audits, do the up and, up and down checks to make them run more efficiently, make sure that our agencies are talking with one another, that we're communicating properly region to region in this state, and we're getting the outcomes that people deserve. I, you know, I think our state government needs like a, a real update when it comes to technology. You know, a lot of the websites that the state utilizes were created back in the 90s when Charlie Baker was the budget secretary. And then he became the Health and Human Services Secretary, and they're using the same platform 
that existed then today. So you know that we can update that. Just call the, the kids over at MIT and say, we got a project for you. Let's try to update this system and, and fix it and make it more modern so that people can interact with government and streamline things. There's just a, a lot of things that are on our plate to streamline, make it more efficient, make it more accountable. That has to get done. We talk about, well, you mentioned things that affect our day to day, healthcare. I'm a little confused. I'm an old man, I'm slow, but <laughs> we had a health care system right. that seemed to be working. And now we've sort of gone away from it to adopt Obamacare. Yeah. I, I guess I don't get it. I think you do get it, my friend Al. Now, I was in the legislature when we had the debate about health care, and, and it was all about making sure we got more people access to insurance because so many were not insured and they were coming to the emergency rooms for services and it was a very uh, inefficient but also wasn't the best way to treat someone's problems and oftentimes they'd leave and come back and wouldn't get the care that they really needed to be well. So what we decided to do in Massachusetts, which was innovative because no other state had done it, was to pass a, a, a bill that allowed for a connection for everyone in the state to have some level of insurance. And we got up to like 98%, didn't we? We did. Almost 100% of the people in Massachusetts insured. That's a great thing. I voted for it. And it was controversial at the time. But once we got through the initial stage of it, people became accustomed people to like it. People like you were out on a limb working. voting for this. We did. But then it started to work. So then the federal Obamacare comes along and then imposes that on us on top of what we already had. And what we needed was a leader in our Commonwealth to say, no, thank you. Massachusetts is all set. We want to protect the health care system that we have because it's working, it's good for our families, and it's good for our business community. We're fine. Move on to the next state that hasn't done it yet. And instead, that didn't happen. And the federal uh, plan was adopted here in Massachusetts. and it it doesn't, has not been integrated very smoothly at all with the health care website that was dysfunctional from the very beginning, has cost the state millions of dollars to fix, and still there are many people that have no access to the doctors and hospitals that they once had, and there are a number of people that were insured that now we're paying for on the public side where they could be paying privately. So the whole system really went upside down and Charlie Baker and I would have handled that differently and we will continue to look for a waiver from the federal program because we feel the Massachusetts model is best for now, Massachusetts. Now I'll put you on the spot, I'll be mean. Do the two of you have the intestinal fortitude to put the people of Massachusetts ahead of the politics so, of Washington? So how hard is that, right? <laughs> this is another <laughs> softball here. Charlie Baker and I absolutely do because we know what's right for Massachusetts. I mean, Charlie Baker can speak with great authority, someone that was the Health he and Human Services Secretary, <laughs> someone that turned Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare around from bankruptcy. I mean, this company, thousands of jobs were about to be uh, terminated, and he was able to turn that entity around and make it the number one plan many years in a row in, in our country. So he knows a thing or two about healthcare. And me being in the legislature voting for it, no, that it's the right thing for Massachusetts. So we will work very hard to protect our system and to correct the, the problems that exist today that have been, uh, you know, sort of going on for too long now, keeping it people in like the dark. It seems like an easy thing, yet you sit there and say, I've got a working system. It's taking right. care of my people. Okay, for political gain, I guess, let's scrap it. And we're going to go to a system that's inferior. Yeah, the idea is that we want people to have access to health. We want people insured. We want to bring more transparency to the whole health care system because Charlie and I feel it's like car insurance. When you as a customer know the price of an MRI or an exam, then you shop around and you'll get the best quality, but you'll also get the best price. And if we can bring transparency to the whole way that health care is, is priced out, then I think that will go a long way. I think we need a lot more coordinated care, and we just need transparency built into the system and a lot of accountability to make sure people are getting the best quality of health care for the dollar that they spend. 
Now, obviously, Charlie's been involved deeply in the health care side. Yes. Both from the legislative and from the business side. Right. Doesn't that give him kind of a unique perspective and an advantage that he knows both sides of it to well, try it and... Well, it certainly is a difference between Charlie and the Democrat uh, candidate uh, who is a prosecutor, someone that is a lawyer that has served in, as an attorney general, but not a manager like Charlie, who managed a state budget in the, in the 1990s under Bill Weld and Paul Salucci, managed a health care uh, organization in state government, and then a private entity, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, a very complex uh, organization. And what he often says is that this was a bankrupt company that was going out of business. The morale of his workforce there that he walked into was very, very low. Uh, and people were very worried that they wouldn't have a job the next day. And he said to all of them, listen, we're either going to you know, swim or we're going to sink. I want us to swim. So let's all get together. Give me your ideas, and we're going to turn this ship around. We're going to try really hard together. And he empowered that team, and he built that team up, and the morale started to get better because they were moving in the right direction. This is what we need right now in our you state government. leadership? We have a public workforce that's many of whom come to work every day wanting to do the right things. They just need better management and better leadership to empower them to do what they need to do every day to serve our public. We just want to get there and, and shake it up and, and get that to happen again. Now, there's 12 Republicans in the state. <laughs> <laughs> Can you be effective in a one-party state? Well, we feel so. Now, what the voters need to think about is the past eight years. You've had one party controlling everything in our state. That's the legislative branch, branch and the executive branch. And look what we have seen. There's been a lot of dysfunction. We just talked about the health care takeover. We talked about the dysfunction with the health care website. You look at the crime lab. You look at the compounding center. You look at what happened at DCF, the Department of Children and Families. I mean, how terrible a story where you have children who are in the care of the state because they don't have a parent or anyone that loves or can care for them. And so the state has to make sure that that child is safe. And we've had instances where they've fallen through the cracks and you've had a child that was lost, gone forever. This is unacceptable. It's completely unacceptable. You need good management in this system to make it work. This is a public entity that requires very strong leadership and people with skills that know how to manage things to come into government right now and do those top to bottom reviews of every agency and make sure that we're setting this up for success, not failure. And right now, we see a lot of need for that management within our system of government, and we bring that to the table. One of the things that just grassroots people don't like to hear is you've got red players and blue players in Washington. Oh, gosh, no. Now, when I think about the era of, I think of Tip O'Neill and Reagan, diametrically opposed politics, but yet, they respected each other, and they could work together. Okay. Now, you had to live in a Democrat-controlled environment on Beacon Hill. How did you make it work? We both did. I mean, Charlie Baker did that in the Weldon Salucci administration when you had them come in, and Bill Weld had a, a lot of good ideas. And he was able to work with the Democrat legislature to get uh, welfare reform done in the 1990s, education reform tort reform, some major reforms that were very beneficial to the working families in our state. And he had to work with a, a very heavily uh, dominated Democrat legislature, which is a very similar situation today. But we feel that one party has had policies that have left people behind, and it's time for that change. It's time for that balance in the executive branch with two people with the business experience that we have and the public experience to balance out that one party in the legislature. When you have that balance, you have two teams on the field, and you're just you know, debating and pushing for the best outcomes, you're going to get it. You're going to get there. But if you don't have that debate, and you just have one party just you know, rubber stamping an idea, it's not the best that you no, can do. Now, we can get this done. I know I served in the legislature. I'll give you the idea of Jessica's law. That was a bill 
that I filed after holding office hours in my hometown on Friday mornings at the senior center, and a group of moms came to me, and they said, you know, we're really worried because our children are at a bus stop and there's a level three sex offender living next door. This doesn't feel right. And I said, you're absolutely correct. This isn't right. Let's see if we can fix this. I discovered that Massachusetts had the weakest set of laws protecting our children from sex offenders. Weakest. I said, we can do much better than that. Did my research, filed the bill, and I worked hard across party lines to get this done. I worked hard informing the public. I worked hard getting on radio and shows like this to ask people to, to support this bill and this reform to make our laws stronger to protect children. It took me three years, but we got it done. And we got it done because there were people in the legislature that viewed this not as a Republican issue or a Democrat issue, but the right it's issue and the right result. It's for the kids. So we were eventually were able to get it done. I know that Charlie and I have like-minded support in the legislature among Republicans and Democrats to move reforms forward that need to get done. We hear it. We know that and we know we can build those relationships. It's really a lot about trust. You know, when you say you're going to do something, you follow through, you do that in your business, in your personal lives sure. as well. And the legislature's no different. You've got to work hard, build those relationships, and get, get, you'll get good results. And we look forward to doing that with them. But, you know, again, I look at the past in Massachusetts. We didn't have the red versus blue stalemate that we see in Washington. Oh, right. When you all were there with Bill Weld, you made it work. We did. You know what? A lot of it is it's just communication, sitting down together. You know, Bill Weld and Paul Salucci every week sat down with the Senate President and the House Speaker. Charlie and I will do that every, at least once a week, if not more, because the leadership sets the tone. It's not the staff that should be talking about these. You've got to set the tone at the top. And if you have good communication, you might not agree on everything. You most likely won't. But if you get you hammer this out at the table, and then you you have a, a a firm understanding as to where each other stands, and you honor each other, you can definitely move the ball forward. It's when you don't talk, right. and people hear things that people might say, and you lose that connection is when you start to lose that battle. Now, a lot of people are going to feel comfortable with the fact that you as a mother, forget mm -hmm. all the politics, yeah. you made a conscious decision to put your kids in public schools. That's a real strong statement, isn't it? I believe in my community. We have very strong leadership in Shrewsbury, and I want to see that type of leadership available to every kid that's going to school, no matter where they live. Your zip code should not dictate the quality of your public education. Now, Shrewsbury, I mean, with my class, kids' class sizes were creeping up there, over 25 to 30, but. You know, we have really good teachers, good communications with the parents. They keep us informed and we work together. Shrewsbury had to pass an override because the budget became unbalanced and a lot of cutbacks from the state level. They had to make some adjustments. And, you know, it's up to every community to do what's best for it. But Shrewsbury has good schools. Charlie and I have been to communities where in one town you can have a level four school, which is the most underperforming school and a level one school in one place. How unfair that is for two families in one community to have two very different schools in the public domain. We need to make sure that every school, no matter what community and no matter what neighborhood, is great. And that's going to require empowering our principals, bringing this accountability right to the level of the classroom, giving our teachers the resources they need to get the job done, and to measure it. You cannot socially promote kids grade to grade. You have to have those tests in place to make sure that they have the minimum level of skills and understanding to be advanced to the next grade. There's a lot more we can do with our education, utilizing our technical schools, our community colleges, helping people apply advanced credits, you know, advanced courses in high school and those credits to college and to bring college within affordability for many working families. And for those that don't want to go to college and they feel another path is available, utilize the technical college, the high schools, so that they can get a skill and enter the workforce and be productive. 
we've got to get more people working again, Al. There's so many areas of our state that they're really struggling with not enough jobs available. And there's so much more that Charlie and I can do on that score. Well, you and, and Charlie I can expand talked on about that too. making a Massachusetts more business friendly. Okay. Because yeah. at the end of the day, if I can't feed my family, right. Karen, I love you. I love everything you're saying. But yeah. if I don't have a job, absolutely. I don't know that a lot else matters. Absolutely. Well, because, Al, you and I embrace and Charlie embraces the best social program is a job. Okay, so there's a couple of things we need to do there. First of all, what's great about Massachusetts is we have all these diverse regions. Okay, we're here in the central part of the state, and we know what strengths we have here. Like right here in Milford, you have Milford Hospital. Great jobs there. I'd like to see more manufacturing jobs back in, in, in this region and every region of the state. In order to get the manufacturing jobs cranking again, we need to make sure that we're graduating kids with the schools that manufacturers need. So those are technical skills. It could be uh, steel work, it can be electrical, it can be plumbing, it can be whatever the trades are. We need to really ramp that up so that we are graduating kids with the skills that exist. They say there's going to be 100,000 manufacturing jobs over the next 10 years that need to be filled. So we need to graduate kids with the skills for those jobs. And region by region, every region is different. You know, what's good from Central Mass might be different from Springfield and beyond. At least you recognize to it. To New Bedford and Fall River, to Boston, which is doing great, to the South Coast, to the North Coast. So we have to have these regional plans and really, you know, streamline the system. There's a lot of levels, a lot of, I think, lack of communication within the agencies that exist that we can streamline and make sure we get that job done. But at least you recognize it. Too many times we feel that to Beacon Hill, Massachusetts ends at 128 and that they need a passport <laughs> to come out. That's often been said. I mean, when you think about Weldon Salucci, remember that was a big deal when Paul Salucci from Hudson was uh, going to run for lieutenant governor and, and the whole thing was the geographic balance. Paul Salucci will give those communities outside of 128 a voice. That was a Scary really good thought. thing. And I certainly want to be that voice uh, for this, the areas outside of that, that Boston belt. And it's important. I mean, Tim Murray, Democrat, he was Another also Worcester able boy. to do that from Worcester, uh, giving the gateway cities a, a real strong voice and, and platform to grow jobs. I mean, Charlie and I recognize there's some really good things that are happening in that gateway city model. We'll take the things that are working and we'll build upon those. But we do need a sense of urgency to all of this. And I think that one of the things that does bother Charlie and I is the level of dependency we find so many people that are living at the poverty level in. And that, like we just talked about, the best way to help anyone out of poverty is with a job. And those that are stuck in that dependency system, we need to empower them with the skills and the child support if it's a single mom that needs that level of care. And then learning how to work, saving money, paying down their bills so that they can get on their feet and then step out of the dependency system. It's not either you're all in or you're all out. There has to be a transition so that you can then wean off of the public system and then be at a place that you can stand on your own two feet and earn your way and be successful. We hear so many people that want to get out of the public housing and out of public dependency. They just don't know how to do it. It's hard. They're afraid. And we have a system in place that will empower people to take those steps, and we want to work with them. We have over 100,000 people waiting for public housing in Massachusetts. And the waiting list is so long because so many people are stuck in the system. In Worcester, they're growing four to five generations of family in public housing. It was never meant to be permanent. It's supposed to be temporary, a place that you come to get on your feet, help you get, you know, get to, going. Get, to get going. And instead, it's become a way of life, and we've got to change that in a compassionate way and help people move forward. The other reform that we said was public housing should be available to legal residents, to veterans, to the disabled and our elderly. And that is a change that should be made because it would make us consistent with the federal policy. Right now, it's available to everyone. 
and we should give preferences to those that are here legally and of course to our veterans. How, I mean, I have a hard time when I look at people who risk their lives for my freedom mm -hmm. and you say, we can't take care of them. I mean, I have nothing against any people, but when there's a fixed pot of money, I don't understand the logic of saying we're not going to take care of our own first. How do you get the attitudes changed? I mean, I was amazed when I heard uh, we want to give state tuition rates right. to illegals and we don't have enough money to help our kids with this horrible student debt, the, the college loans. That's an example of something that's very different between what Charlie and I stand for and what the other candidates running for governor and lieutenant governor stand for. And we feel that those are failed policies that are not helping working families get ahead. Now, working families that I meet here in Milford and Shrewsbury and all around the state, the moms and dads that are getting up every day, they're working hard, long hours, they play by the rules, they're paying their taxes, doing everything on time, saving trying to save, and they want their kids to have an opportunity for a great school and something for the future. They want, everyone wants the next generation to be able to do a little better than, they, than they've done. That isn't so much the case right now, and I think that's because there's just not a lot of vertical movement on that ladder for people to climb and get ahead. Like they're working, 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 but feel stuck, can't get ahead. They're going on a treadmill. And then those that are in the dependency system aren't getting out because there's not enough opportunity to have them incentivized to get out. We're going to require work. We're going to make sure that the benefits that are provided are here for our legal residents and our veterans first. And of course, uh, tuition for colleges is so expensive that you need to make the reduction, that discount, available to working families that are here in Massachusetts legally. You've got to do that, that's a benefit that should come with doing everything right every day. Uh, the other is regarding licenses, uh, driver's licenses, and I know that we have a major immigration problem. Uh, it's a very significant issue that the federal government has to take care of. They have to address this, they have to put some ideas on the table and fix this. And at asking a state like Massachusetts to provide driver's licenses to those that are here illegally, I think just perpetuates that problem. And it's something that is very different from what we stand for, Charlie and I, and the other side stands for. Of course, we feel that if you're contributing and you're earning your way, there should be benefits that come with that. But we have to put the benefits there first for our legal residents. And you know, you think through it. How do I look at somebody from New York who wants to go to UMass? Now, we've invested a lot of money right. in building a first-class university. Right. Somebody from New York, American, paid his taxes, grew up, says, I want to go to UMass. Well, that's double the rate because you're not from Massachusetts. That's okay. But they say, wait a minute, can I just pretend I'm illegal? Yeah. <laughs> then I can get half rate? Yeah. It, it doesn't make sense and to me. And that just is an accountability. I mean, you need to have a government that checks these things so that you need to provide documentation that you are a legal resident, that you are a taxpayer, that you are contributing before you can avail yourself or anyone in your family of the benefits that other taxpayers pay for. And that's just a management system. We will hold the system accountable and we will get better results. And, you know, we feel like the public benefits are there and that safety net is there to help the most vulnerable in our community. We want to make sure that that safety net works to get people on their feet. And when you have people that cheat it and abuse that and double dip with EBT cards and everything, that but waste has to hurting? be eliminated. The waste, that's waste. That's somebody that's taking dollars away from other people that exactly. really need the help. So if Charlie and I, with our management skills, can eliminate the fraud and the waste and the abuse that we all know is there, millions and millions of dollars, and then take that money and use it to help the people that are in the safety net, empower them with the skills and the support they need to then not need the safety net and get on a path to self-sufficiency and a better life. That's what we should do with those dollars. 
and stretch them as far and wide as we can because that's what people do every day in their lives at home at their checkbook at their kitchen table that's what they do with their small business down the street the mom and pop stores or anyone that's taking a chance starting a business you know they deserve a state government that reflects what they do every day and that's the kind of biz that's the kind of government charlie and i want to see back here again in massachusetts talk to me you mentioned ebt cards again yes. I'm old, I don't understand some of these things, but if I want to go on an airplane, I need an ID. If I want to go into federal buildings, I need an ID. Is it wrong to say that the EBT card should have a picture so that you know it's me spending it? Oh, I think there are, there's technology, there's, there's so much we can build in to that benefit card because we want to hold up that system we want the integrity of that system to hold up because you're, this is taxpayer dollars that we all give to government because we need government to function to help people and to perform a service. And so it would be very easy to bring that level of accountability into the system to make sure that whoever is using that card is exactly the person it's assigned to and that they're getting the benefit of that. But it's the abusers that we know we can weed out, and we will. This can be done. Other states do it. It's not like that we would just be inventing this for the first time. Other states, I think, do a better job than we do in making sure that the fraud and the abuse is vetted out. We will do that. It's one of the first things we will do. That's what we hear that people want us to do. And then to take those dollars and use the dollars to help the people that need help within the benefit system. We'll save millions of dollars and we'll help more people get on their feet. And that's the goal that we now, have. I don't know if I can say it. I'll blame Charlie or I had Harvard Pilgrim Insurance yeah. and they gave me a card. And I could charge my pre-tax dollars to this medical card mm -hmm. and it was great. But if I went to buy a candy bar, the card would tell me no. It's not meant for candy bars. Right. You can buy drugs, you, you know, the good the things that will help you. Right. Why can't we take the same technology that he put into my little card to the EBT and all? There's, there's no reason why we can't. But that's why it's time for a Is change. Is it just political will? It's a time for change. We can do this. And we need to do this. Because people have a distrust for government. Uh, the hardworking people that get up every day and do things right expect this of our government. And we all feel a sense of compassion toward those that need help. Let's make sure that the people that need help the most get it. It's a very simple thing to change, and it's the right thing to do to make sure that our government is functioning. I can tell you, I had a hard it time can be done. listening <clears throat> to any logic that says it can't be done when I go to CVS, I get the prescriptions and all, and I it put it on my card, done. and it knew that if I put a candy bar on there, that wasn't medical. It can be done. So it's just political will. It's a political will that we will bring <laughs> to state government when we get there, uh, hopefully in a short period of time. Okay. Another question that an old man may not know. What's a lieutenant governor, and what are you going to do with that office when you get it? That's a great, a lot of people do ask that question. Uh, the lieutenant governor mm -hmm. is a statutory position that um, is empowered to uh, oversee, uh, one of the functions is to oversee the governor's council. Uh, the Governor's Council is a, a, a group that was a, serves as like a check and a balance on judicial appointments and other appointments within the, the judicial branch. And also, from my point of view, above just what the statutory requirements of Lieutenant Governor are, is, Charlie and I are a team, so we differ from the other candidates running because we are two people that want to be running the government together as governor and lieutenant governor. And we feel we bring the range of experiences in the private sector and public sector to this team to be able to do the work that needs to get done for the people of Massachusetts. So we know each other, we respect each other, we have a common vision and ideas and plans to move our state forward. We're friends. And that's a very important asset to have for two people that are capable and committed and professional to run our commonwealth. So we, 
are our own brand in that way, much like uh, Paul Salucci and Bill Weld. Because I was in. thinking about that. When and you think about, sorry had, to interrupt, but you hear Weld Salucci. There was a team Correct. that the one plus one felt like three. Yeah. You know, <laughs> right. I mean, you Isn't don't hear good? Weld. It's well and you don't hear Salucci. Right. It was always Weld Salucci. So you're committing to us that this is a Baker Polito yes, team? Yes, it is. That one plus one will equal three? One plus one will equal three, however that adds <laughs> up, right? It adds up to a lot. And, and the reason is because when you look at our experiences, both of us know municipal officials because we served as selectmen. Both of us know state officials because I worked in the legislature and Charlie worked in the executive branch. Both of us know business friends and people in the business community because I'm an active member of the Chambers of Commerce, certainly in this area, and a small business owner, and Charlie, a larger business experience. So we know people in all of these areas, and together we're going to tackle these problems. And like Bill Weld and Paul Salucci did, they had those weekly meetings at the state level so that there was good communication. And we will have that open door policy with our friends in the legislature and the business community and the municipal leaders that we need to have. And I think having that, that table set so that people feel they can come right in and give us their ideas and work together with us to make this state better is exactly what the state needs. The best ideas come from the local level. They don't come from Beacon Hill. And when I remember when I was in the legislature, holding those office hours, getting those ideas from people, and then putting those into action. That's the best way to do it, and we will continue to be that kind of leader here in Massachusetts. Well, you talk about transparency, and I've got to tell you from a personal yeah. level, I always felt more comfortable that you had Weld Salucci not part of the clique, the carrying the dogma, Oh, yeah. It always seemed like we heard more about what really was happening when well, you I, had that. Sure, I think that's important that uh, you have two people that know everything that's going on in the state. So if the governor steps out of state to do what he needs to, you've got someone that can just keep that ball moving ahead. The lieutenant governor's office is just steps away from the governor's office. And we want to make sure that the people know we are a true team going in there. But it wasn't just there. a single party either. And it, I, it wasn't. And, no, it wasn't, in that we work across party lines to get things done. We know how to do that, and we'll do that again. It's the only way, because people want government to work again. They don't want people blaming and pointing fingers and things being stuck like they are in Washington. That's so frustrating to people. So many people say, I don't even, my vote doesn't matter. I mean, look at, look at, they have a distaste or a distrust toward what's going on, and I think largely about Washington. Now, we know that we've got to clean up in Massachusetts too, there was recently a probation scandal where people were being hired with s skills that they didn't have for the jobs that were very important. You know, we've got to restore the integrity to the system of government and I think that balance with Charlie and I balancing out the one party state that we have will do that. There are so many people yearning for this kind of leadership to return where there's a lot of respect, a lot of camaraderie, but principled uh, people that have conviction and ideas and a vision and a plan that's different from the other candidates that are running to move our state forward. And I think that sense of energy and that, you know, that fresh look and that sense of urgency to get things done is important. You know, government has been notorious for not valuing time. As a business owner, you know, looking, you know looking for a permit to be turned around by the state, there's just like no sense of urgency to getting that done. I was just with a municipal leader in Quincy, and he was waiting for a permit, a municipal city mayor looking for a permit for a seawall. It took nine months for him to get the permit. There's no reason for that. And so we want to make it work again, you know, get it going again. And I think we bring that. In fact, that, that city mayor, a Democrat, came out recently to endorse Charlie and I as his candidate for governor, lieutenant governor. He said, because you're the right leaders, you're the right people for the time, we need this change. And it's the right thing for my city, because you have a respect for what local leaders need to do for their communities. And he gave us a perfect example of how a mayor in, the, in a large city could not get something done because of the inefficiencies of state government. So it's time. 
it's time for that well, change. I mean, when you look at it, maybe there was a day when the red and blue dogma made yeah, sense. Yeah. But today, I think you're right. People want purple. They want in the middle. Well, yeah. Tell look me at what you'll do to help me. Well, I mean, if you even look at the electorate, most people are unenrolled in Massachusetts. Yes. Over 50 percent of the people don't as align themselves with either party, which says to me that people right now are looking for the best person for the job. Who, if you feel like state government is broken, then you need to hire a manager to fix it, right? We are that manager. We are people with that experience to fix it. If you think that state government's fine, then there's someone else that will maintain the status quo. We won't. We want to raise that bar, challenge the status quo, and do things better. We think there's a whole lot of room for improvement with regard to how there, our state I don't government think anybody can functions. Argue. And uh, just that whole idea of getting those jobs out there for people to work toward. We need a whole lot more of opportunity. There was Karen. only a, a little over a percentage growth in Massachusetts in our economy. Massachusetts should be killing it. We have some of the best colleges and universities. People from around the world send their kids to these shores for them to go to school. We should be retaining that talent with jobs here in Massachusetts and entrepreneurs growing more businesses here and manufacturers want to plant their roots here and small businesses adding jobs. That's really not happening right now because there's a business climate that's uncertain here in Massachusetts. Employers don't know how much it's really going to cost to add that employee. Health care, energy, regulation, are the taxes going up? Is there a better state for me to plant my roots as a business owner than Massachusetts? So we have an opportunity to sort of redefine and reshape what Massachusetts, from a, an employer standpoint, mm. is going to look like. Before I go Charlie and I are going to get on that top of that state house and say, we're open for business but I'm looking and for we that. want you. You know, when we're in business, we're looking for somebody who'll say, look, guys, we're going to lead. Yes. Trust us. Give us a chance. Right. Because before we go investing and adding burden to our companies, I want to make sure, as you said, the business climate is going to get better. Because if I don't believe, if I think it's going to stay the same as it is now, okay, that's kind of lukewarm. And right. I don't know that I really want to bet heavy on the future, the short-term future. Right. I think Charlie and I will bring that level of leadership that the business community will respond to, being two business leaders ourselves, to run our state more efficiently, but also just to crank up the innovation economy, the technology, the manufacturing sectors, making that connection between our education system and the economy with the skilled workforce that will be able to fill the jobs for today and tomorrow. Yeah. We can do this. It hasn't been done. If eight, eight years shows you where, where, what they have done. Now it's time for, I think, some new leadership for the next eight years. And I believe we're the right people for that job. Can you get our voices heard? I mean, we joke in the biotech side that we really believe in the state in Beacon Hill. They're trying to cross a giraffe with a cow. So yeah. they can <laughs> eat in Metro West and give milk in Boston. Yeah. It just, you know, it's a frustration when you hear that, but it's kind of a systemic indicator that people out here are feeling like all the resources are flowing one way. They're flowing. I mean, Boston is booming. Everybody knows that. It's a world-class city. We all want our capital city to be great, and it is. I mean, you drive into Boston, you see cranes everywhere. There's new buildings going up everywhere. That whole seaport area is just yes. booming. That's all terrific. But... There is a lot of life outside of that circle. And, you know, frankly, uh, many people move further west or away from the city because it's more affordable. You can, you know, have an apartment or maybe buy a home and have a neighborhood you can raise your children where there's a good school and, a, you know, a, a good community to grow up in. And that's really further away from the city that makes it more within reach for a lot of working families. So the idea is that if you're going to plant your roots out here in Central Mass or Metro West, it would be great if you didn't have to commute, you know, oh, an hour and a half to two hours a day, although you could if that was your choice. You, you have trains that are available to you. But wouldn't it be nice if you could find a really good paying job 
not too far from home so that you can have supper with your children. You can coach uh, football or Little League, or you can attend a practice for your kids. That's where quality of life comes into play, and it comes into play really significantly when we have the jobs available region by region for people to work toward and climb that ladder. And you get it, because for eight years I commuted <clears throat> into Brighton. I left at 5.30, I had my coffee, and I was at the lab in 45 minutes. Right. If I left at 7, it was an hour and 40. Right. And that meant if I'm leaving at 5.30, my children aren't up. Right. And not that it was, I mean, it's kind of corny, but I liked seeing my girls yes. for those 15 minutes, even though, you know, by the time they hit teenagers, it wasn't a lot. Yeah. But it's so nice to see good paying jobs happening in Metro West yes. so that I can come home and be with my daughter, you know be it soccer practice, be it stuff. Right, and when you look at Worcester, Worcester's done pretty well recently because of the colleges that exist there. WPI has done a, a phenomenal job as part of Gateway City, yes. Gateway Park. for biotech. For biotech, for research at UMass. And you gotta remember Mount St. James. I right. know it's gonna kill you to think of that other Jesuit school, <laughs> <That's> but. <right. laughs> I know, but it's, uh, it's, it's making that connection with the universities uh, we've got community college system and loca locating those in downtown areas where people can work and go to school and do all that. There are so many good models. We don't need to sort of invent it everywhere. If you find a, something that's good that's working in Worcester that might also work in Lowell or might also work in Bedford, then let's replicate this. And if there are certain strategic investments that the state needs to make to help that development, then great. Let's map it out. Let's have the plan and then let's move it forward. And I really do believe in the, the regional approach here. And Charlie and I want to identify a key person on our staff that is going to compare Massachusetts to other states that are maybe doing it better and identify what those barriers are for growing that innovation and technology uh, uh, industry and reduce those barriers so that we can Again, put that sign up open for business, and we want you to be here in Massachusetts. I mean, you think about it. I mean, I've got a bit of a partial uh, view of Holy Cross since I went there, <laughs> I and my that. daughter just graduated. But I'm able to offer internships, and we've kept a few of them. Yes. These kids in Worcester Excellent. can't go to Cambridge. Right. It's just not practical. Right. But by having jobs out here, when we had a young man who just came on, Very did good. fantastic. He graduated in May. Two weeks later, he started working for us. Fantastic. That is one thing we do hear a lot about from parents and students, this whole idea of, okay, higher education, if that's your goal to go on to, to college, that it has to be within reach. How do we make it within reach? Well, we're working with the public system now to have a three-year degree so that you can go uh, full-time for three years, utilize online education, utilize your summers, and get your degree in three years. That saves you one year of tuition in a state college or university. That could be fifteen thousand dollars right there. At a private school, BC or Holy more. Cross could be fifty-nine right. this year. So we would love to to transcend that to the the private universities as well. Utilizing the online education, we think that's very important. But getting to what you just said about the co-ops, Northeastern has long had that program where you attend school but also work, and almost 100% of those students graduate from Northeastern with a job. Yes. And the idea is that if you're investing in a, in a higher education, that you need to have a job when that day comes that you graduate. And we want to make sure as good public policy that when you graduate, you stay here and work in Massachusetts. We want to retain that talent. We want to retain that person that grew up here so they can lay their roots here and have that fourth generation of family here in Massachusetts. I think that makes for a really strong commonwealth when the next generation wants to return and continue the tradition and, the, and be close as a family unit for the next generation. I think that's very valuable. That's certainly how my family uh, thrived here. Well, and, it, and, it, and it does make for, I think, a stronger, I remember, less transient state. Well, I remember when I had a networking group in the biotech yes. sector. We had somebody from the administration come out, and one of our members asked, do you ever make it outside of 128? Yeah. 
And it was amazing because she meant well, but she said, absolutely, we go all the way to Western Mass like <laughs> Worcester. I know, right. And I had to stare down because I knew two of my members wanted to come unglued to right. say, excuse me, we don't consider Worcester Western, Western Mass. Mass. Although I'll, I'll adopt all of it because I'm from here and I'm happy, happy to do that and give it a voice. One of the things I just learned, not just learned, but it's been going on and it's a very good thing, is the incubator space. So when anything in uh, the biomedical field in, or in technology, Kevin O'Sullivan, a former rep in the mm -hmm. State House, has this... In Worcester. In Worcester. And what he does is the kids will graduate from WPI or even be a junior or a senior at WPI and have an idea about a startup business. And they can rent basically a clean space and then have common area too at very, very low rates. And they may even have a, an investor, small amount, to be able to begin their business. And they don't have That's to fantastic. buy all the equipment that Kevin supplies. Right. It's very, very good. We could good. go on forever, but... Because we want to see it. It doesn't have to always be in Boston. It can happen in go. Worcester. That was my point. I've got to stop you because we're at the end. Are we at the end We're now? at the end. It can't be. I'm from Milford. Why should I vote for you? I want you in Milford to vote for Karen Polito and Charlie Baker as your next governor and lieutenant governor because it's time for a change. We feel we are the right brand of leaders to help move our state in a new and better direction. And for the working families here in Milford that get up every day, play by the rules, do everything right for your family and for your kids to have a future in Massachusetts, we are your only choice. And we want you to believe in us because we believe in you and we believe there is opportunity for your family to have good schools, a safe neighborhood, and an opportunity to get ahead. And we're asking for your vote. I look forward to 90 days after the next 46 when you're in office to have you back right. saying, tell me what you've done in three months. All right, deal. Let's thank. do it. And as always, to our six loyal viewers, <laughs> thank you for listening. As always, I'll never ask you to vote for anybody, but you know my preference. Most important, get out and vote. Get to learn the candidates. Get to find out who can help us best make the changes, and help our residents here at the center of the universe. So as always, may God bless. May tomorrow be a better day. And thank you for spending more and more time, as you always do in Milford. Good night, all. That's good. The center of the universe.